Welcome to our class. We are learning Ashlag Kabbalah and we are working from this book which is called The Inner Work. And it is a compilation of, um, of excerpts, small excerpts, from a lot of the articles, a lot of different articles that was written by Rav Yehuda Ashlag, who's known by his Nom de Gras as the Bala Sulam, the keeper of the ladder, the master of the ladder. And he was a great, um, perhaps the greatest Kabbalist um, of the modern generation, and he wrote a, a commentary on the Zohar where he completely took out all of the codes. The Zohar is written, as we know, they seem like stories. A man is walking, and he meets somebody, and he sees a horse, and we think, and we have no idea what they're really talking about, and it's very encoded. And the Bala Sulam went and he said, um, let me tell you exactly what they're talking about, okay? And we have reasons why it was encoded, because in past generations, People were not ready to understand what was written there. They would not have understood it. And if what they did understand, they would have corrupted. They would have tried to take the light of the, the light that reforms, the light that changes you, the light that transforms you into a, uh, a whole giving being. They would have taken it and tried to put it into their lights, into their vessels of reception. They would try to use it selfishly. That's called, the Rabbi Shalom Ashlam tells us, that's called Vashti. Vashti was the embodiment of trying to Take everything that God's giving you and make it work by taking it selfishly. And that's what everybody tries to do. That's how we were created. And it's only in this generation where we realize that you get one car, you get three cars, you get ten cars, and what happens? You're still miserable. You get popular, you get famous, you get become a big famous person, and then all of a sudden everybody dislikes you and you're miserable and you don't know what, right? So we realize now that we need balance and we need unity and we need peace and we need love, we need transcendence. We realize these things in this generation and therefore we are able to accept the light that is hidden in the in the Zohar and that's why the Bala Sulam, Rav Yudashlak decoded it. The whole study of Kabbalah is a, is a, is a methodology where we are transformed and we are, so these um, excerpts, these small little excerpts, are meant for us to try and shift our perspective. So we're not trying to, we're not going to change like that. What we are going to do is we're going to start to see, um, see things differently. And once we start seeing different things, you know, they say the Balasul explains that you know we like what our community likes. And so if I go somewhere where everybody likes sports cars, after a while I'm probably going to like sports cars. And if I go somewhere where everybody's into fashion, I'm going to get very into fashion. So that's why the Kabbalists say you have to have a good community and you have to convince each other. That you know it would be the best thing. You know it would be absolutely the best way for me to spend my life, to become a, a, a transcendent person who's an altruistic person and is not a selfish person. And if we truly, truly, truly believe that, then we would go ahead and we would do it right away. But we don't believe it. So the study of Kabbalah, the first step is for us to convince each other that all the problems are caused by our selfishness, and that if we would fix that one problem, the world would be an amazing place. We see. In reality, it is not possible in our generation to attain attachment to Hashem by studying only the revealed Torah. The material temptations have increased and the light that shines from the revealed Torah is not outweighing the overpowering materialism. Therefore, our generation definitely needs to be involved in learning Kabbalah. Okay. Kabbalah can be called big boy Torah. And so there's things that they're told that you don't, in past generations, they would never tell you. And so and things that even today that people don't tell you. So here the Baal is telling you that for the average person, studying Torah, the revealed Torah, is not going to bring them to adhesion with the Creator. It's not going to bring them to this transformative uh, place. And the reason is, is that this world is much, much more exciting and much more egoistic than it was in generations past. You know, if you were sitting in Poland and you had potatoes three times a week for, for dinner, um, it wouldn't be, uh, the world would not be that interesting, it would be that distracting, and perhaps you would be able to like glean from studying Torah all day, You'd be able to glean the purpose of creation and the, what, the, what they were talking about. So people in past generations would study Halacha, and they would study Gemara, and they would study Chumash, and they would understand more readily what was being said there. They would understand the inner aspect of what was being said there. But in this generation, because we have video games and we have movies and we have everybody has, wants to be, get a you know, fancy house and fancy cars and stuff. And so here the Baal was telling you that it's really, really important that a person study, uh, a person in, is, who's doing uh, Torah and mitzvot study Hasidut or study Kabbalah because otherwise they really will not um, focus their attention uh, adequately enough to actually be transformed by Torah and mitzvot. You see that 
unfortunately, one of the things that can happen to a person who studies Torah and mitzvahs is they can become very, very successful and very, very um, happy with themselves. A person become very, very smart, very, very wealthy, and very, very, you know, um, have a lot of success in life, and then they will miss the point. The point is to be to be transformed. Okay, let's keep going. Would you say in the past that most people didn't have those skills, only like an elite group, and now everybody has access to... Yes, it's not skills, they didn't have the vessels, and so what you had before is you had, so if you start, somebody asked is that, is it the reason in the past is people didn't have the potential to, to be able to do Kabbalah, that's exactly right, and so what, let's, look, let's look at the Torah, you start with Avram Avinu, one person, and he is all by himself and he understands these things and everybody else in the world is a pagan and doesn't understand what he's talking about. Everybody thinks, no, no, I don't know what you're saying, but that's not how the world works. And then you have, slowly but surely, he builds up you know, a few hundred people and they start to understand this and the rest of the world does not understand what they're talking about. You go went back a thousand years, people would be very happy to get together, get on their horses, go somewhere next village and chop everybody up and take all their stuff. And they would say, this is what the world is. And they'd have gods that would, they would pray to, to help them in battle and to help them with all these things, right? That would be, that was the way people really thought it was. And so, as you see, the trajectory of the Torah, the narrative in the Torah, is that each time, more and more people come into the system. So the first time you had Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the Baal Sulem explains that that's why the Jewish people had to go down, the Israelites had to go down to Egypt to become a nation, mm -hmm. just to get to that first, so the Baal Sulem says something very, very interesting. Until we had the first 6,000 souls, this was not even possible. That's why the Torah, what the Torah was talking about is meaning putting the world back together in this unified way, in this transcendent way, meaning putting all of creation back together, but in the aspect of altruism, instead of the, instead of the selfish nature that we experience, right? So all the vessels broke into pieces and we're putting it together, back together, but we're not putting it back together the same way that it fell apart. We're putting it back together and fixing it. Mm -hmm. And it was right, so we are, so when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they became a nation at Har Sinai, they got together 600,000 souls, what does that mean? They put it together, they put all 6,000 men and all the women who support them and all the children, it's everybody, but we talk about men and let's not go into the reason why we use men instead of saying everybody together. There's very, very deep Kabbalist reasons and we, we touched on it many times, but let's not have that class right now. But the 600,000 souls of these 600,000 men and all of their families, this took a Brit, took a contract, uh, they made a contract with God. We are gonna live this new way. We're gonna live like everybody's gonna care about everybody else and not about themselves. And this is what made them receive the Torah. Mm -hmm. They received the method of doing that. Mm -hmm. They said, we're gonna do this method. They took a, they, that's why we are, as Jewish people, that's why we are obligated to this to do this work. That's why the Jewish people, if we don't do the work, we get into a lot of trouble. The world gets angry at us and all these things and we're confused ourselves, but the truth is, is that we have a higher obligation because we took a contract. So if you are, if you sign a contract that says you're supposed to do something, you have to do it. And if somebody else didn't sign that contract, they don't have to do it. They're not gonna get in trouble. You're gonna get in trouble because you signed the contract. And so the truth is that we like uh, sign the contract. When you go to the Marines, they tell you, you're now pledging to the Marines. And so now you gotta go fight. And so if, they, if there's a war, you go fight and they don't go fight. You can't after, after you sign, after you take the oath in the Marines, you can't say, wait, wait, how come they're not going to war? How come they're staying in the, in this, in the, in the towns? You say, well, they didn't take the con they didn't sign on to the Marines, you did. And so we signed on to this contract. And it's a good thing that we did, and it's a beautiful thing, and it makes gives us a, a, a tremendous amount of, uh, and people can join us. We know we're Jewish, Jewish religion, we accept converts, and so people can join if they want, but it's a, it's a huge obligation to do, to take on the obligation of doing this method. We came to Har Sinai, and then we fell out of that, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah. we, went to the, we went to Israel, we got into Israel, and we started again, we had the first temple, and then we had the second temple. So each one of these, if you, if you read the Torah Kabbalistically, each one of these ascensions are times where we were successful in doing Torah and mitzvot and unifying as a nation to achieve a certain amount of unity. The, 
the first temple was a higher unity than the second temple. We're not going to go into why that is, but let's just assume that it's a process. So imagine you were going mountain climbing, and the first time you went up the mountain, you got all the way to the top, and the second time you went up to the mountain, you only got up to the fifth, to the fourth base camp because your whole your whole point of the mission was to resupply base camp four, not to go to the top. So why is the second temple lower than the first temple? There's Kabbalistic reasons. Why did it have to happen like that, and why it did happen? And you can even peek into it and see, make a you can make a guess on your own. And you can see that the Romans came in and they took some a part of the Judaism and brought it out to the rest of the world. And so this is all a process. And that if you start to understand the spiritual evolution that's underway, you can start to understand these things. Why? That's why people become very smart when they study, they study the Torah mitzvahs. So um, as we move into future generations, what happens? We are including more and more people in the unity. So now that the Jewish people are back in Israel, what are we trying to accomplish in when Mashiach comes? Is the Torah and mitzvahs going to the entire world? And the entire world, everybody on their level, joins into this unity. So you have a, a, a body, your body is unified. You have a complete body, you have feet, you have legs, you have a brain, you have ears, all of these different... And if you had to rank which system was more important, you would clearly put the heart and the lungs and the brain above the ears and the elbows and the toes. But the point is, is that when you have, when you achieve unity in humanity, the hierarchy takes a back seat. So like we said before, when you go to a party, you don't say, hi, here's my brain, my brain's, I name my brain Bob, and here's my lungs, my, my lungs are Tony. You don't do that, you say, hi, I'm, my name is Yehuda, that's me. So we're not concerned with the hierarchy. The only reason why we are, concerned with the hierarchy in life. You see now in this generation, people are very disturbed by the hierarchy. Right? I don't like the fact that you're, you're smarter and it's not fair and these people are like, right, they want everything to be equal. So what are they doing? They're tasting prematurely messianic consciousness. They want everything to be equal. Yes, we have equal, everybody's equal, meaning the body all works together, all of humanity works together as a single unity, but Inside of that unity, there's a hierarchy. Why is it like that? You can ask Jordan Peterson, because he talks about it all the time, but you would see, you would soon see that if you need some people to be doctors, and some people to be lawyers, and some people to be this, and some people to be that, you would understand that you need to have differentiation, and you need to have all these different parts, because you, have, you put this whole thing together. So let's not go down that rabbit hole, but you see that you have a functioning system, a, 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 a functioning system has both aspects of equality and hierarchy that are themselves in perfect balance with each other. Okay, I'm saying a lot today. Wow, we're going, we're going, we're getting real uh, serious here. Okay, let's keep going. If we see ourselves as faulty, we are, consequent, we are consequently projecting fault on our Creator. Therefore, it cannot be that we are lowly and deficient and defective. Seeing ourselves that way is seeing an external illusion that is not true, okay? So let's read this again because <clears throat> it's amazing. If we see ourselves as faulty, we are consequently projecting fault on our Creator. Therefore, it cannot be that we are lowly and defective. Seeing ourselves that way is seeing an external illusion that is not true, okay? So basically what he's telling you here is just like the Matrix, you know, the movie The Matrix happens to be based on Kabbalah. It's not like a very particularly authentic uh, brand of Kabbalah, but there are very a lot of Kabbalistic... Uh, concepts that are, that are explained in, um, in the Matrix movies. Anyway, here what he's saying is that we perceive ourselves in time and space. And so here I am, and I'm not my perfect self. So I see that I have all these um, feelings about myself, that I'm not the person that I want to be. But I'm where I'm going to end up is going to be in a perfected place. And so I must be outside of time, I must already be in that perfected space. So in potentiality, I am my future self. I am going to become whatever I, whatever potential I have to become, I will become that thing and therefore that potential to become that good person. So for today, I'm a much nicer person than I was when I was, when I was 14. When I was 14, I was much more selfish, much more unaware of people's feelings, right? But I had, I was going to grow into the person that I am now. And so, what we're seeing now is a construct of time and space that God has made for us so that we can do the work of creation. If I saw 
that everything was going to work out perfectly, and God was perfect, and I'm perfect, and everything is perfect, then I wouldn't have anything to do. So the mercy, that's why I say that God, that we say in the Torah that God created the world with mercy. So even all the hardships that we're experiencing and all the limitations and all of these things that we are experiencing are in fact gifts for us. And so that is the secret of Kabbalah, the secret of Torah mitzvot is that the Balaswam says that if you, when you win the lottery, you don't start celebrating when you pick up the money. You start celebrating when you get the winning ticket. So that's why we should know that we should know that we are already have reason to celebrate. We're already in a great place. It's just that we don't know that we're in a great place yet. And if we knew we were in a great place, we knew where we were gonna where we were headed, then we would have a much easier time moving through each of the stages of development in an amazing way. Imagine like I told you, you're gonna become the biggest lawyer in the world. You're gonna become the best lawyer in the world. And then I sent you to law school where you were struggling terribly. You could not understand what was going on there. You would have the knowledge that you're gonna become the best lawyer that ever lived. And so with that knowledge, with that knowledge, you would be able to not be anxious, not be upset, and somebody would come over to you and say to you, gee, you're really terrible, you can't understand anything in this class. You'd be like, yeah, I know. You'd be like all cool about it because you know that who you're gonna become. You know that that guy, that professor who's telling you that you don't know what you're talking about, one day is gonna be coming to you because you're the most, so what we need to do is here, the, the Baal is telling us is that we need to understand that everything that's happening to us with all the mistakes and all the problems and all the confusions and all the falling down is all part of a process where we're going to become perfected and to not know that and to not think that is to be making a complaint not against yourself but against God and saying to God, so say, what is a tzaddik? A tzaddik is somebody who, who testifies that God is perfect and God is doing a perfect job. So we all think that we could do a better job than God. But the bottom line is that if you want to be a sadiq, all you have to say to yourself, with all your problems and all your mistakes and all your avera and everything that's not right, just say, God's doing a perfect job. Because that's the truth of the inner truth that we don't see yet. Is that everything is going to work out perfectly. We're all going to be united. And everything, the world's going to be a beautiful place. And we're going to all be very, very happy with God. Amen. Okay.